Today on Lockdown Red Wings, we go over the Ville Husso trade as well as rounds two through seven of the NHL draft. Your Locked On Red Wings, your daily podcast on the Detroit Red Wings, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to the Lockdown Red Wings podcast. We are your hosts, Brian Fisher and Scotty Bentley. I am a podcast producer for WWJ News Radio. While Scotty is the host of Lockdown Tigers as well as a freelance journalist for the Detroit News. And today, guys, pretty straightforward, pretty simple. The rest of the draft happened on Friday and Saturday. Well, just Friday, rather. Is that that draft that they chug it? They just chugged through. It was crazy how fast. Yeah, after the first, man, they mean business. And so we're going to talk about that and everything that had happened in the uh, that last day of the draft on today's episode. Um, and yeah, I think the first thing we need to lead off with before talking about rounds two through seven and the eight other draft picks that the Red Wings had is I think the most pertinent thing that happened was waking up on Friday morning to the fact that the Red Wings have traded their third round pick in that 2022 entry level draft for St. Louis goaltender Vili Husso, who was a UFA to B. So what they did is they just basically traded their third round pick for the rights to negotiate with him. And he very quickly signed a three year and 4.75. Let me double check on that when I have it up right in front of me here. Uh, 4.75 per season contract with the Detroit Red Wings. So he is the goalie for the Detroit Red Wings with a modern modified no trade clause through 2025 season, the end of the 2025 season. So, first of all, Scotty, instant reaction to that. I guess instant reaction. It's been a few days. Happened on Friday, but knee-jerk reaction, rather. How do you, how do you feel about trading for another goaltender two off seasons in a row? So happy. And and look, like this is. I tweeted this out, but we have one. Like a, a this is a now solid goaltender room. Like it is, and and. This this goalie room is is now like you see analysts that aren't just like Detroit based like national media members talking about like how how good this this Detroit goalie room is and how this like they're they're young guys like it's not you know it's not necessarily oh they, they have two goalies that are in their mid 30s and like they're good right now like these are dudes that that you could keep around for a while and um the, the the current goalie room is solid and the future goalie room is is presumably only going to get more and more solid as those two continue to get better and then Kosa's obviously uh once he's put into the mix there in a couple of years and so it that that's really exciting but I tweeted this out it's you know Iserman has made this incredibly solid well respected like pretty highly touted goalie room out of two third round picks and Jonathan Bernier who the was rights a U- to John who, who was a UFA, right? Like that is that's that's remarkable that uh, he has turned those three assets into not only a goalie room for the 2022 season, but a a really solid, well respected goalie room for the future. Yeah, and that's the big thing about it is both of these guys are so young in the goalie uh, room right now. So Nedeljkovic's contract is up at the end of the season. So you could theoretically say Nedeljkovic doesn't work out. You can let him walk because, you know, he'll be he'll want to move on to bigger theory, and better things in theory. Yeah. Um, so you have two guys, one's 26, one's 27, two incredibly young goaltenders who Nedeljkovic, all things considered, was pretty damn good for a Red Wings team that was really bad last season. Vili yep. Husso had a nine, what, 919 save percentage. This past year with the St. Louis Blues, which is incredible. His goals against average was uh, in the twos as well. His goals saved above expected was 14.18. So he saved 14 goals above what was expected for him. So he performed very well on a St. Louis Blues team that was really good. And there's a lot of criticism that says that he performed so well this past year because he was sheltered, because he played on a good St. Louis Blues team. And that's a lot of the same criticism that Alexander Nedeljkovic faced um, coming out of Carolina. And there, what, you know what? There was a little bit of merit to that, um, in my opinion, because you didn't see Nedeljkovic replicate those extraordinary stats with a much worse Red Wings team, but also the Red Wings team was much, much worse. I'm not trying to like blame Nedeljkovic 
any case, uh, uh, you know, at all, but the stats may have been a little bit inflated. So you might see a little bit of a decrease in that save percentage with this Red Wings team. But of course, this Red Wings team isn't the St. Louis Blues. This Red Wings team isn't the Carolina Hurricanes. But if they can stay, have a save percentage above 900, much like Nadelkovich this past season, it's going to still be a successful season for these goaltenders, especially at their age. Do you remember the race? Uh, like as the season was was coming to an end, where you and I, after every game, were like, "Oh, we really want Ned to finish over 900." And like every game, we we're <laughs> like checking his his season save percentage. Like, "Oh, is he gonna finish over 900? Is he gonna finish over 900?" Was it 901 or was it exactly 900? I think I think it was I exact. Right I feel like it was exactly 900, but I remember with like three or f- four games left. It was at like eight ninety nine, and we were like, "Oh, come on, yeah, yeah." And then he had a he had a pretty solid outing there. That's yeah. I, I just remember the the race to nine hundred for him was so funny to me. But but um, you but now it, have it is telling though again because, like you said, this defense was was. It was I, awful. I mean, let's be it honest. Awful. It was it was putrid, right? So the the fact that he was even able to do that in his first full. See, you know, rookie eligible season in his first full season uh, in the NHL is is pretty, pretty darn impressive. And uh, I think it's only up from here. And especially if we can get some more reinforcements defensively. Yeah, there's a lot of youth here and there's a lot of potential here. And that's really what's exciting about it is that these two guys take a step forward. Because remember, guys, goalies, even though one's 26, one's 27, they're young by goalie standards. A lot of goalies, sure. both of these goalies didn't come into the league until late. Like Nadukovic was technically still a rookie last year. He had two rookie seasons. I think Huso last season was his first season as uh, his first full season at the NHL. I think he had 17 yeah. games played the year before and that was it. So these are two young goalies are still developing. So now you have a tandem of two really young, talented goaltenders and they're going to be able to pave the way and hold down the four with a great tandem of a one, a one B. I think Greg Wyshynski of ESPN said that this might be one of the scariest tandems in the NHL because they're so young and they have so much room to grow still. And then on top of that, the fact that Sebastian Kosa is going to be a few years away. I, I got to imagine with how much Kosa dominated the Western hockey league, he's going to take a step forward to go to at least the ECHL, if not the AHL, because I mean, he's not getting challenged at the Edmonton Oil Kings level anymore with that league. Yeah. That division I would have, was bad to begin with. I would imagine he starts off in the E for sure. If he look, I'll say this: if if he if Kosa ends this upcoming season in the A, I, I will cry like that. That would be that. That would uh, I'd be so unbelievably excited if he ended the season in the A. I, I would imagine that uh, he'll 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 play in the E, and and I think he'll probably stay with the Oil. I don't know. I go back and forth. It wouldn't shock me if he sta- started sure. next season with sure. the Oil Kings again, and then you know, like he's still so young too. Um, but I, I agree with you. I don't, I think his his days are limited with uh, with where he's at currently. Well, I think another thing too. What was so savvy about this trade by Steve Eisman? Because one, I mean, when you get to the third round of the NHL draft, it's very hit and miss if these players are ever going to even see the NHL. Yeah. Um, playing field, even and a second, honestly. I mean, the ability. So the the goalie market is bone dry this season. You have you had Mark Andre Fleury who signed an extension. You had uh, Jack Campbell who's set to be like the UFA agent. You had Billy Huso. I mean, you have Thomas Grice. We everyone knows that it's it's a very thin goalie market this uh, off season coming up. You know, Blackhawks traded for Morazic because the Maple Leafs needed to unload, but there's just really no one out there. So it was very savvy by Eiserman who wanted another goaltender because it was Ulki Niora and Magnus Helberg weren't going to be your backups. And the fact that the Red Wings needed another backup, it was very savvy to trade a third round pick to get the negotiating rights, to get a head start on all these other teams who are just hoping that these goalies would hit the free agent market. Because Huso was one of the more sought after goaltenders in the free agent market this year. So it was great pop props to Steve Eiserman to getting ahead of it and you know, putting the flyer out there to get the, get him in Detroit, sign him to that extension. I have to imagine the trade wouldn't have gone through if there wasn't a previous agreement for Huso to sign an extension. And he probably saw Detroit as a good opportunity to really cement himself as a s- actual like good goaltender, not just someone who is sheltered in uh, the St. Louis system. Yeah, and and we we can talk about it now or right after the break, whichever you want to do. But I, I, I think I think the the discussion about his playing time is a fascinating one. Like, I think that's the right. I think that's the, the most fascinating thing of all this is like, there's a 
for as much as we like Ned and, and as much as this fan base believes in Ned as a part of the, the future of this goalie room, I mean, there's a, a very, yeah, real possibility that, that he comes in here and plays 38 to 42. I, mean, I think it's going to be perfectly even split. Yeah. I think it'll be. It wouldn't surprise me at all. I, it's going to be, these two goalies are going to be competing for the starting role, I think. Absolutely. I, it it I mean, also might be, you know, it, it might be intended to be a, a 50-50 split. And then, you know, like we saw last year, if Ned, if Ned goes on a tear and has back-to-back shutouts or whatever, then, like, he'll continue. Like, they're clearly not afraid to put him in, in uh, have him be goalie for both games but back-to-back either. So, like, it wouldn't surprise me if, you know, either of them got on a heater and, and maybe skewed that a little bit so it wasn't perfectly 50-50. But I, I think the intent for sure is that. Yeah, the biggest the biggest promising thing that I see here is that, you know, because there's a lot of that criticism saying that uh, Huso was just a product of St. Louis Blues because they have a good team. They have a playoff team, so of course his numbers are going to be a little bit inflated, but his goal saved above expected being a positive 14 metric, you know, leads to believe that he performed well in, despite the great team around him. I guess despite is not the right word to use, but you understand what I'm trying to say. So that, Mm -hmm. that gives me hope that he's going to be a solid goaltender in Detroit as well. And I'm, I'm completely like, I saw the trade. I was like, okay, let's go. We like, we don't have a starter backup. We have a great one, a one B situation again. And I was fine if they wanted to take a step forward with that and give Nedeljkovic the, you know, starting role full time to see how that worked out. But I'm also okay with them going with another goalie in a similar situation as Nedeljkovic and making it 1A, 1B and let them compete for it because they're only going to bring out the best in each other. Right. Absolutely. No, I'm, I'm, I'm super, super excited. This is yet another uh, fantastic Stevie trade. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. Today's episode is also brought to you by Athletic Greens. This next partner is a product you guys need to use literally every day. Start taking Athletic Greens because with one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole whole food-sourced superfoods, probiotics, and aptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy recovery, focus, and aging, all of those things. It's lifestyle friendly. Whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free, contains less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no chemicals, or artificial anything while still tasting good. Athletic Greens was created when the founder experienced a ton of gut health issues and ended up on a complicated supplement routine to recover. It cost him $100 a day. Athletic Greens is a climate-neutral certified company in 2020 AG produce carbon credits that support projects protecting old growth rainforests. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop in a cup of water every single day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash NHL network. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash NHL network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance insurance. Oh, I butchered the last word Almost right at the got end. There. Almost got there. Almost. Huh, that one's a, that one's a, that was a good one. Athletic greens rocks. Uh, segment two lockdown Red Wings podcast. Scotty, do you want to move into the draft? Do you have anything else to say about the Billy Huso thing? No, I, th- I think that's it. I think we got uh, we got everything out there before the break. But it, just uh, a, another very, very solid move and, and another reason to be excited about this upcoming season and another reason to be excited about free agency because now we will not be in the market for a backup goaltender and we still need to spend a lot of money to hit that salary floor even. Nonetheless, 10 million. Right, nonetheless hit our cap. So now you're eliminating – well – I guess you extended him, so that, that'll add to it a little bit, right? But you're you're no longer in the free agent market, at least, going to go after a uh, like one of those veteran, you know, backup goalies this year. So um, it'll be interesting to see what happens. It makes free in, free agency even more interesting than it already was. But uh, yeah, I, I think we we go into uh, we go into the draft and and see who else they took because there's some fun there's some fun players in there, man. I, yeah. I really liked our draft. I really did. I, I liked it too because everything I was saying before the draft is the Red Wings need to draft centers. And they drafted, let's see here. So Marco Casper they, was one center. They got a total of two, three. 
literally counting it four <laughs> and then five centers. They got five centers out of the what nine picks that they had. Um, the uh, other two were left wings and another two were de- defense. So they only drafted two defensemen in this draft, which is, I would say smart because they're really flush with defensive prospects and they're really shallow in offensive prospects. I like the um, defenders they took though. Oh yeah. I liked, I mean, I don't have a qualms with any of the picks they took. I know that, uh, the, their second, second round pick, Dimitri, Dimitri Buchumlikov, I'm going to say is how it's pronounced. Nailed is, it. Yep. He is, a, he re-entered the draft. He had fallen off the Red Wings. He wasn't even ranked on a lot of people like, to go in the draft, and the Red Wings took him in the second round. But, you know, there's been a lot of comparisons drawn about how, you know, Red Wings, Steve Eisman took Kucherov late second round, and he took this guy. It's like, don't do not do that, guys. Don't set yourself up for expectations like that. But I guess the best way to go about this, because there's, there's eight guys to cover, and we have 15 minutes to get through them. Um... I'm just going to list off real quick who they drafted and what position they play and where they played last season. Uh, in the second round, they drafted Canadian Dylan James. Uh, he's a left wing, six six foot tall, 181 pounds. He took him with the 40th overall pick. Uh, this past season, he played with the Sioux City Musketeers, of the USHL, with 61 points in 62 games. Um, I, I really like that pick just because it's another wing. It's another left wing. They need four depth in a bad way to go right back to the four depth pool just seems to make a lot of sense. And overall, just for them to keep doing that, I, I really appreciate it. And then, like I said, Scotty, uh, to round up the second round 52 overall, they took Dmitry Buchelnikov, trying yep. to take that slope. He is a left wing five foot, 10, 168 pounds out of Russia. He played this last year in the MHL of uh, SKA 1946 St. Petersburg at 75 points in 56 games played. Very impressive performance from him in his league. Um, Center and left wing. First two rounds, Scotty, completely dedicated to rounding out that forward core. How are you feeling about that? I really like it a lot, man. And and it's it's really crazy because, well, crazy might be too much of an exaggeration, but... um, I the the Dylan James pick is is just fascinating to me, um, like really physical pick and and physical player a lot on the wings and everything. Um, I, I just he seems to be very much kind of that uh, that that gritty t- like Bertuzzi type of player is like the the comp that a lot of people within the organization were making so. That one's really fun to me because getting him at 40th overall, players like that, if their bodies can hold up, tend to have like higher floors because, you know, dirty work is something that is needed at every single level in every single league. Um, Whereas, you know, speed and skill kind of depends on where your talent matches up with everybody else's. So I really like that one a lot. Um, but the the Dimitri pick is probably one of my favorite in the draft because that was that was really that, off the board. Yeah, it, literally, no, it, <laughs> it it was it, it was and um, but I I mean there are also some there are some scouts in and around this organization and in and around other organizations that uh, he he was he was all over the place like he's the definition of like some people had him like even higher and some people literally didn't even have him getting drafted. Like he went undrafted last year. You know what I mean? Like he's, he's all over the place, but um, people talk about the, the, the skating in the hands and like a pretty solid shot and everything. Like he, he, that, that might be like the definition of higher ceiling that most people realize, but also like a floor of never even making the NHL. You know what I mean? Like yeah. those kind of players are always just like so fascinating to me. And so it's, uh, it's, I, I think that one's a really, really fun pick. I like, I really like the Dimitri pick that, that might be one of my favorite. Uh, I think probably my second favorite in the entire draft right behind the, our, our fourth rounder that we'll get to after, but um, but yeah, I mean, there, there are one scout said first round caliber talent in terms of skating and hands, uh, with a dangerous shot. So like that's, that obviously leads to, you know, he's a little small, which is something that, that they'll obviously work on. But, um, I, I really like the pick a lot and I, I like those, even though they're risky and they don't always turn out and sometimes they make enemies out of people. I really enjoy the boomer bus picks just because I enjoy 
uh, holding out belief that a boom is going to happen. <laughs> yeah. there. So I completely agree with everything that you just said. I'm just struggling over here because um, there's a lot. Their, their next pick in the fourth round, his name is Anton Johansson. And apparently Anton Johansson is a very, very like popular name in Sweden because I cannot find our Anton Johansson legitimately cannot find his profile. And I am struggling right now. And I think it's hilarious. Wait, what did you say at first? Anton Johansson. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What? What? You can't find him. I cannot find his profile on uh, elite prospects. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's kind of hilarious. Because there's so many Anton Johansson. I mean, I, I can give you a quick rundown. So, I mean, yeah, first off, it. he's he's huge. He's 6'4", six, six, four, six, four, 180. So, like, so I want to interrupt real quick. Sorry. The reason I knew the one I was looking at was the wrong one, because I saw they drafted a defenseman that was 5'9". I was like, this is not an Iserman pick. Yeah. I scrolled yeah. down, saw he was drafted <laughs> in 2020. I was like, yeah, this is not the right one. So, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, so Johansson's 6'4", 180. Uh, last year... For Lexens in Sweden, he had 49 games played, 13 goals, 19 assists. That's obviously, as we said earlier, as a defenseman. Uh, Chris Draper, who is obviously the head or director of amateur scouting, uh, said that he really liked the path Johansson has been on in the SHL. They're excited about Johansson's size and ability to move the puck. He probably needs a couple more years to develop physically before thinking about playing in North America, but they are excited for his future. Uh, that little breakdown is brought to you by Ted Coughlin, friend of the program of the Detroit News. There as we well. go. Um, but yes, the uh, I, I I this is this is my favorite pick in the draft. I think just another just big bur- burly defenseman <laughs> uh, that that can go and, and wreak havoc and, and play with some physicality. Um, not bad. And I mean, 13 goals in 49 games for a defenseman. I know it's a different league and, and everything, but I mean that's not a bad. Uh, Mark either. Uh, And again, it's another big defenseman that can skate. Well, that's the profile that if you are over, if you are six foot three or taller and you are play defense and you can skate, well, congratulations. You are a Detroit Red Wing. That's how it works. So they're really excited again about, about his mobility. Yeah. If he can, if he can, if his mobility is there, he'll be a stud. Like you draft big guys and you just hope that their skating comes along and then they'll be fine. Like that was the big thing that kept McElrath back is he never really, he was always just fat footed. He was not that good of a skater. He had all the other physical attributes, but he was slow and not very agile. So as long if these big guys can keep learning how to skate, then he'll be good. Uh, I, I like that pick a lot just because it never hurts to have too many big defensemen in the system. Uh, let me get to the second ad read real quick. Today's episode is brought to you by BetOnline.net. They are your number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. Find all the latest sports developments, league reviews, and news, including this year's NHL playoffs and Major League Baseball. BetOnline is your continued source for all your sport wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. And BetOnline.net remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. BetOnline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite sports and events, including MMA, boxing, and golf. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. Bet online, where the game starts. Segment three, Lockdown Red Wings podcast. Scotty and I are going through real quick, kind of rapid fire, the, co- the players that the Red Wings got in this draft. We just went over very briefly their first of three fourth-round picks, um, Anton Johansson. And the reason I couldn't find him on Elite Prospects, Scotty, because there's a show more option. That is how many Anton Johansons there are in Sweden. Wow. I did not click show more to get to the one that was born in 2004. So wow. I was like, what? I'm like, where is Man, this isn't guy? isn't that crazy? It's These like kids getting drafted or born in 04. We I don't got to talk about it. We don't got to talk wait. about it, Scotty. Oh, <laughs> their second of three picks in the fourth round was probably the coolest name that they drafted. Amadeus Lombardi. Of the Amadeus. Flint Firebirds. Go and stay in Michigan for this pick. I like that oh, a lot. Although he was born in Canada, but the Flint Firebirds, a five foot ten center, 165 pounds this season, uh, with the Flint Firebirds and 67 Shout games played. Shout out Flint. He had Shout 59 Flint points, time, 18 goals, and 41 assists. He seems like he's gonna be a, a, a his track looks like it's gonna be a playmaking role. If he's racking up that many assists at the a, uh, OHL level. That's probably the track he's going to go on. I don't know if yeah. you have any quotes about uh, Amadeus Johan or Amadeus Lombardi, rather. Uh, but- yes. So again, this is anything I say is via Ted Coughlin. Uh, so just to make sure the credit is clear, 
uh, was ranked 94th amongst, amongst North American skaters for NHL Central Scouting. Uh, playmaker first type of player. Good puck handler. Good distributor. Uh, an impressive rookie OHL season, as we talked about. Um, he's a season. He's over an. Sorry, his season is an overage player, as we also talked about. He needs to get stronger, which is the big thing, as we said at 5'10", 165, a little small, especially for a center. Um, but I think people are just really intrigued with his uh, skating and his playmaking, and that is, you know, if you can be kind of a, I don't want to use like the the stereotypical like key and and like hit words for undersized like centers but if he can be crafty <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> and like get through and and find his way into lanes and and be just a high iq good skater uh, i mean good things will happen so this is and again uh, like the reality of the situation is what if if half of these dudes are contributors at the nhl level that's like a unbelievably massive success like yeah. so we're, we're talking about upside and everything and all these dudes have some upside in them and that's obviously why they were drafted to to be nhl hockey players at some point but um you know i i don't want excitement for you know if we say a bunch of positive stuff about everybody that doesn't mean we think that every single player <laughs> is going to be like crazy good at the nhl level the, um, the, the, but, the reality is is we don't know we don't know yeah, we can does. only that, we can honestly only yeah. say what we have heard Right. And the best I, scouts in the world don't know. That's why that's why 70% of these guys don't make the NHL ever. But it, exactly. it is it is uh uh for him specifically, hey, shout out Flint, man. But but it's it's just really cool to see um after the play styles that they went with at the forward position earlier in the draft, this one kind of goes against those a little bit and is a little more of an undersized, like I said, kind of kind of craftier playmaker. So it'll be fun to see him develop too. Um, let's move on then. Cause we got like another four or five people to get to here. Uh, four people, Maximilian Kilpinen. He is born of Sweden plays in Sweden, uh, for the J 20 national team, the Ore bro HK J 20, 25 points in 27 games played. He's a six foot, 175 pound center. He shoots left. And uh, just going back to the center pool and going back to Sweden, I, you guys are going to notice a big trend here. If you haven't already, it's that Eisenman trust Lidstrom, Cronwell, and Hakan Anderson in Sweden to pick their p- picks. And it's it's worked out great for them so far. And one of the things I see here is that some um, is that he just seems like he's going to be a pretty good, you know, well-rounded player. What do they, what do you, have you heard anything about this player? Um, Let's see here. We have, uh, I mean, <laughs> you're getting to the later players now. So. Yeah, the later players, it's honestly like, well, it's, uh, another, it's another forward, um, listed as, as a wing, but also has played some center. Um, I, I guess the big thing on him is skating and hockey sense. That that's pretty much all I can give you. Yeah. I mean, these are, again, you're getting to the point in the, the rounds where it's just, who knows in the end they drafted in the fifth round at 137th overall they drafted tanias matherin i'm gonna nailed it think that's tanias i think you nailed it this is another big boy six three two hundred six three two hundred 63 200 pounds baby that that is uh that that's work for sure and and plays for, for him, the north bay battalion of the ohl right and and again you know if if this sounds familiar, stop me. A really big defenseman that they think skates pretty well. Um, <laughs> he, uh, he, he, one of the biggest things that he really, um, Ted points out that he really excelled in, in the OHL was the penalty kill, which, you know, is obviously, even if you're not fantastic five on five or never turn into a top four defenseman, if you can provide an NHL team, special teams minutes at, at a productive pace, you're going to find a spot on a roster. So that being that that was kind of his specialty in the O is um is is kind of a, a, a cool thing. And I like that for a pick this late, you know, maybe a, more of a specialized pick. Um, I guess they, the scouts believe he also has some untapped offensive potential in there. Ted points out. So good. Um, then we have in the sixth round here, seventh round, sorry, 201st overall, they took. Owen Mellenbacher, 
of the USHL Muskegon Lumberjacks. He is a center, six foot two, hundred and ninety pounds, shoots left, and had forty two points in fifty six games played. Really showed out with the Lumberjacks this season. After uh, the season before, he only had twelve points in forty six games played. Got much more responsibility this year. Had a, again another guy who produces a lot of assists, but scored at quite a decent clip as well. He had eight points. Four goals, four assists in the playoffs with the in the USHL as well. So it's just taking flyers on big guys who can produce. It seems to be the the mo for the forwards, just guys who seems like they can be big playmakers. And then for the de- defense, big guys who can skate well. Uh, Correct. The last, the last player here. The the is, breakdown on Owen is literally uh, certainly a project, but also certainly worth a gamble this late in the draft. Exactly, and that's what these are at this late. That's in the draft. what all of these dudes are. Their final draft pick of the uh, well draft was Brennan Ali. There's actually some stuff on on Ali because a American. center, b American, and he will play at Notre Dame. So we will actually be able to watch him at like easily a lot a lot easier uh, over on uh, on this side of the pond. And um, so yeah, he 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 will play at Notre Dame this year. Another physical player. Uh, like physical forward, which again seems to be a, a pretty reoccurring theme in this draft. Um, but yeah, the, he'll be cool because we'll actually get to see him play uh, again at, at Notre Dame this fall. So that's gonna be awesome. I might actually, I, I almost don't want to say this, but I might actually catch a couple of Notre Dame games this season. Then. I know, I know, but I mean. There you have it, guys. The overall takeaway from this draft is we don't know what any of these guys are going to be yet. We hope for the best, but I like the fact that they really hammered home forwards, especially centers. Got a couple more big big defensemen. I mean, Steve Eiserman has kept to his philosophy on big D men. Um, but center just the depth, fact that man. center depth. Like we 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 talk about exactly. it so much. We've talked about it so much for the last year. Like that that's been a big problem. And like last year, the 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 Tigers had a like pitching depth issue, and they just drafted like a million like starting pitchers that that had like crazy spin rates, right? Like this is the, a very similar thing to that, where everybody knows that center depth is a big problem, and so we went all out and got centers or got forwards that that have played or could believe that they could play center as well. Just a a lot of a, a lot of um, of swings to, to try to hit on some centers, which I'm, I uh, very much like. I'm not even joking. I'm looking at elite prospects and like on the sidebar, there's like a scoring leaders and you know, who's listed on scoring leaders, Brian Fisher. No, Anton Johansson, not our Anton Johansson. There you go. Yeah. Six right, foot two defenseman. who's 28 years old. Cause there's nine of them. There's, well, there's more than nine of them. <laughs> there's a uh, guy that the, the elite prospects challenge, go on elite prospects, search an Anton Johansson. Just look at, how many there are. It is egregious. What is the American equivalent of that? Like some John Smith, John. Yeah, maybe. Oh, like, yeah, yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, also shout out guys, 1000 subscribers. Appreciate every single one of you guys. That is amazing. Uh, we could not have done it without you guys. Just love you guys so much. We are so it, it's great for two awesome. reasons. I mean, one, because you guys rock and a thousand subscribers is a big achievement. But also, if I'm being candid, you can monetize at a thousand and it will help us bring better quality to you guys as well. So sure. we really appreciate it. No, it's awesome. Really, really big milestone and, and definitely a, uh, uh, a a big accomplishment for uh, for us and for y'all. So we yeah. Yeah, forever appreciative, as we say all the time. Literally couldn't have done it without an as awesome of a fan base as the Red Wings have. I mean, you guys just are awesome. Absolutely. Um, any final thoughts, man? We ball. We do ball. Uh, thanks for making Lockdown Red Wings your first listen every single day. Now make your second listen Lockdown NHL. Lockdown experts give you daily 30-minute podcasts on all things NHL all year long. Stay up to date on everything in the hockey world, including Lockdown NHL, your daily 30-minute NHL podcast. And then, so development camp is this week, so I'm assuming we'll have stories coming out of that. We'll cover that for you guys as well. That'll be a fun week. It'll be a fun, fun week. Fun week. And then the free agency opens up on, what, the 13th? Yeah, 13th. and so uh, Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. Let's try and see if yeah, we can do um, some stuff with that. Like you said, camp, maybe, you know, people for to talk about some of those picks more in depth. We'll, we'll, we have a lot of off-season left, so. Yeah, well, we, we are going down to three episodes week. a week. 
well, I mean later, but yeah. later, later in July, but that is coming. So yeah, we'll be August, down. we'll be down at three a week, but it'll still be, you know, an entire month of, of, of content there. So. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be fun. Stick with us. Appreciate every single one of you. Same time, same place. It's your team every day, every day.